Anyway, so tonight my sermon is called New Gold, New Person. I'm going to speak, I'm going to go through it kind of fast. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, how many of you have set a New Year's resolution ever before? Even, oh, who, yeah. anybody said any this year? We're going to read the time Read the time Yes. Yeah. 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 That's the perfect one to start. Yeah. Okay, uh, anybody else set a New Year's resolution this year or ever before that, that anybody, what, what, what? 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 Going once, going twice, what's your new resolution? Have you set one? I have like seven, I can't think of them right now. Oh, Do your top five. Uh, be more positive, pay yes. uh, my loan down to $5,000. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Those are pretty good ones, man. Yeah. 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 Carl, what's your new resolution? Get rich. Get rich. Yeah. Callie, what's your New Year's, New Year's resolution? Uh, you, you were saying me. <laughs> to get good grades. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron, what's your, what's your New Year's resolution? Huh? What's your New Year's resolution? We're going through everybody. Second Corinthians 5 17, you may have heard this passage before. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Anybody ever heard that verse before? Sure. Okay. Okay. It's a pretty common verse out there. But I want you to understand what this verse is trying to say. At the very heart of the gospel, at the very heart of what we believe, at the very heart of this religion we practice, at the very heart of this relationship with God is transformation. The very heart of the gospel is transformation. See, Leonard Ravenhill said, he, he, there's a quote, he said, The greatest miracle that God can do today is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world, make him holy, then put him back into that unholy world and keep him holy in it. Okay. Leonard Ravenhill also said, Jesus did not come into the world to make bad men good. He came to the world to make dead men live. Transformation. Listen, if you come from death to life, that is a transformation. You can turn from bad to good, but that... You can just base that on your actions. Maybe your heart's still not right. Okay? He came to the world to make dead men live. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. No, Paul does not say you have been transformed. What do you say? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the Paul does not say you've been transformed. He doesn't say the work's already been done. God's already transformed you. You're different now. No work needs to be done. 
It is present tense for a reason. No one is transformed overnight. He says you be transformed. Be transformed, which is present tense. Right now, I want you to be transformed in this moment and continue to be that way. It's present tense. No one's transformed overnight. One may have an eye-opening, life-changing experience in one day. Paul did. Remember when Paul was on the road to Damascus and he sees his bright light and God starts speaking to him, saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he gets knocked off his camel or whatever in the world he was riding and, and then he gets blinded. He had this really crazy experience in one day, but the transformation didn't just happen at that moment. True transformation will continue to happen. Paul went into a time with the Lord for three years where he was in communion with God before he really fully stepped out into his pro proclamation of the gospel. You don't see that in Acts, but in Galatians, he talks about it in his letter. In Galatians 1, it says, you know, I went and spent three years away like with the Lord, learning about him before I really went public. He talks about that in Galatians 1. Okay, So it's talking about being transformed right now Constantly, consistently being more transformed. What are we to be transformed into, though? I mean, caterpillars turn into butterflies. What, what are humans supposed to turn into? What are we to transform into? 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are being transformed to the likeness of God. Once again, present tense, we are being transformed. Not, you were transformed. He's talking to Christians here. Paul's talking about himself here. He's not saying, you've been transformed. He says, we are being transformed into the likeness of God. Man was created in God's image. That image has now become distorted. Do you know that? Man was created in God's image. We were made with, not actually like interest, but we were made to be like God. Lions weren't. Other animals weren't. We, as humans, were made that way. But the image of what God is is distorted now because we were made to be like God, and now we don't look like God because of our actions and our behavior. So now the image of who God really is is distorted. Do you see where I'm going with this? See, we were made to represent God, and guess what? We screwed it up. We messed it up. And now it's hard to really have an image of who God is that's accurate. But God can bring man to that likeness of him, bring him back to that representation of him through the power of the Spirit. Alistair Begg said it this way, In the beginning, God made man in his own image. Since the fall, man has been seeking to return the compliment. We've been seeking to make God who we want him to be. But our ultimate goal is to be transformed more into the likeness of God, and more into the likeness of Jesus, who he is. You've heard that many times before, becoming closer to him every day, becoming more like him every day. So what does a transformed or transforming person look like? There's a lot of New Testament examples, or New Testament passages really that examine what a transformed or transforming person is like. We're just going to look at a few. Number one, they are dead to sin. There's a few passages here that kind of talk about that. Okay, What's a transforming person look like? What's a transformed person look like? In Romans 6, 6, it says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Jesus can't die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, what's the penalty of sin? What scripture says the penalty of sin? Death. <coughs> Jesus never sinned, and yet he was killed. He died. But he was raised back to life through the power of the Spirit. And he's alive. He's dead to sin because he overcame sin. And we are to consider ourselves the same. That when, his, when he was raised from the dead, when, when his power flowed out and comes to save us, ultimately, in reality, we are now dead to sin too. Not physically. We haven't died to death the penalty of sin. But we must consider ourselves as if sin has no place in our lives anymore. We're alive to God. Just like Jesus was. The transformed or transforming person is no longer bound to sin. They are free in Jesus Christ to do what is right. Anytime that you're free to do one thing, sometimes it's because you're bound, you're unbound from another. If you're bound to sin, you aren't free from sin. You might be, if you're bound to sin, you might be free to do sinful things, but you're not free to live holy, to live like Jesus. 
So that's what scripture means when it talks about freedom. Sometimes people say freedom and they use that as a license to sin. Well, no. It means we're free in Jesus Christ from the chains, the bondage of sin. And we don't have to be bound by those things anymore. We don't have to be controlled by those things anymore. See, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6. He talks about how you cannot serve both God and mammon, which means money, basically. He was saying, you know, you can't, like, don't make money your God. And a lot of people, I think, take that and they say, well, you know, I don't, you know, don't want to like, get so hooked up on money and like money so much. And I think it goes even deeper than that. Sometimes we let money control our decisions rather than faith. Sometimes we say, oh, there's only $1,800 in the checkbook. Um, maybe this isn't really God's will to do because it's going to cost me $2,100. And you know what? If it's God's will, it's God's bill. Right? J. Cover, a missionary, you know, says that if, if it's God's will that something should happen and you pray and believe in faith, it can and will happen. And so never let money be a determining factor of what you choose to do if you believe you've heard the voice of the Lord. Um, obviously, some decisions you make need to be based on money. The houses you buy, some of those different things. But ultimately, don't ever let money control who you are or what you do. Because Jesus, if you're obeying His will for your life, money is almost not really a factor in the way we make it sometimes. And when we talk about dead to sin, no longer bound to sin, 1 John 3, 6 says, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. So what's he basically saying there? I mean, he's almost saying, if you're, if you're a Christian, you don't sin. Do you realize like it says that in Scripture? No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. If you are living with God, if you are in communion with God, if you are constantly with him in his presence, if you are constantly trusting in him, you're not really going to be sinning, right? Because you're going to be close to the one who can free you from those. You're going to be close to the one who has freed you from that sin. He says no one who keeps on sinning has seen him or known him. See, that's not really perfection. There's some people out there that claim that like you can become perfect as a Christian. Like you'll never sin. And that's not necessarily true. Right? We know everybody falls. Everybody fails. But there is a certain point to where our, our, our sinful nature is always inside of us. But those small little sins that maybe you did before you were saved, some of those those minor things that maybe even you did when you were first saved, there comes a point where maybe they're not a part of you anymore. Because you're in communion with the Lord, and sin's not on your radar. Well, you make some mistakes every day, yeah, but ultimately, like, sin's not on your radar, so you're not out doing those things. Number two of what a transform, transforming person looks like. You're more like the spirit than the flesh. Well, first of all, we know that to be transformed is to be the opposite of this world and culture we live in, right? If you're transformed, you're different than what you were before. And ultimately, in today's day and age, people that aren't Christians are pretty much like their culture or some culture, right? That's very ungodly, unbiblical. And then, so to be transformed into likeness of Christ is to be countercultural. It's to be different than the world that we live in. It's to be in opposition almost to an extent of the world we live in. One could even say we are called to be in opposition of the patterns of the world, the evil that is. We're called to be in opposition of that evil by our very nature that we have in Jesus Christ. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. So that verse makes it very clear to us that the world is of the flesh. Right? When, when the Bible talks about the world, you know, the worldly things. It's talking about the flesh, our flesh nature. We as humans in bodies, physical bodies, have a fleshly, sinful nature, and that's brought out in the world. You see that in the world. But we're called to be like the Spirit, because God is Spirit. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. It says this in Galatians 5. Here's what some of the flesh, some of the world... This is what you see in society today as young people, and it's very evident in, in middle school and high school most especially. These are some of the things you see that is basically saying, this is what we're not to look like as Christians. If we're transformed or transforming, we are not engaged in these things anymore. This is not who we are. We're not like the world, which is what these things are. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, those are all kind of touched on sex stuff. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, which is like sex parties with alcohol and stuff, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, Paul said, if you're a transforming person, if you're being transformed by the power of God in your life, this is not who you are. This is not what it's going to look like. If that's going on in your life, you might reevaluate because you might not be being transformed. But instead of being like the flesh, right, what do we have to be like? We have to be like the spirit because God is spirit. God doesn't have a physical body. Jesus came down and he came and was in physical flesh as a representation of God to us. 
but ultimately he doesn't have a physical body like we do. He is a spirit. And what brings us down really is our, is our physical, our flesh. That's what brings us down to that sinful nature. And we need to be more in tune with our spirit and with the spirit of God because our spirit isn't bound to sin. Because like our spirit isn't, its nature isn't sin. The nature of our body, of our flesh is sin. But our spirit, the fruit of the spirit, you've ever heard of that before? The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. A transformed or transforming person. This is ultimately how you can tell if you're a transforming person. If you're being transformed by the power of God. If you are, and I'm not even saying Christian, I'm saying being transformed by the power of God. You're going to bear the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to have that love, that joy, that peace, that patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those things will be evident, and if they're not fully evident now, they'll be building and getting stronger, growing. Transform, transform. We are called, every one of you in this room is called to be a transformed, transforming person. Once again, when Paul wrote that letter to the Romans and to the Corinthians and all that, he was talking to people that were already believers, and he said, we are being transformed. You know what? A lot of people think that you can just have this, like, alter experience, and all of a sudden everything changes. Anybody notice that even if you get saved, nothing, like, your surroundings don't change? It's not like all of a sudden you're on a cruise ship sailing down the Amazon or something? Like, it's not, that's not how it works. Like, it, your surroundings don't change. Your nature doesn't, like, what, like, your environment doesn't change, but you change. David Wilkerson says, faith is not to get out of a hard place, but to change your heart in the hard place. Right? Because, see, we talk about productive environment. You can change an environment, but that doesn't mean you'll change the person. You can change a person, that doesn't mean the environment changes. But I'd rather change a person than an environment. And I'm not talking about physical environment, but I'm saying, okay, for example, does it, when Hitler, Hitler was a really bad guy, right? That's, we'll just establish that right now, one of the worst men in history, okay? He lived in, in basically a mansion overlooking... A beautiful landscape that none of us here have in Berksville. I mean, overlooking mountains and valleys and just a beautiful landscape. Great environment. You'd think a guy like that would be a pretty nice guy. He gets to go out every morning and see this great view. He's got a nice mansion, a nice house. And he's one of the most evil men in history. Your environment doesn't always determine who you are. It doesn't have to be. And when God comes in, even if your situation at home doesn't change, maybe, maybe there's somebody that's getting molested, or maybe there's somebody that's getting abused, or maybe there's somebody that just simply has to go to school every day and deal with the ungodliness around you. None of that's going to change when you are being transformed, when you've been saved. But you are the transforming one. God's transforming your heart. He's transforming you into His image, into His likeness. And see, here's the other thing. Ian Bounds said, the, world, the church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. We come up with all these methods of how to reach out to people with the gospel. But ultimately, God's greatest weapon on this earth one of the, is us. Like, God doesn't need us, but he's kind of counting on us. God chose to use us as catalysts to save the world. We are not the Savior, right? Jesus is the Savior, but we've been chosen to present that message. We've been chosen to bring the message of salvation. We've been chosen to be the ones to fight that war. Fight that battle here. So we can go around changing our environment all we want. We can go and change the things going on around us. We can try and change and get out of a bad home life, a bad situation, a bad school system. But ultimately that doesn't do anything in our heart like what Jesus can do without changing anything around you. But he starts with you. You've heard this song, Man in the Mirror, by Michael Jackson. You know, he talks about, he's, it's, who's it start with? It starts with me. It starts with my heart. I can, I need to, there needs to be a change in my heart first before I go out trying to change other people, before I go trying to change some environment so it's better for somebody else. Think about it this way. How many, how many kids get tossed through 20 foster homes in their lifetime? They go from one foster home to the next and suddenly... I mean, we thought all these foster homes were a better environment than the abusive home they were in for the first eight years of their life, but somehow they're still such a terrible kid, right? It's not about the environment changing around you. It's not about what, what goes on. It's about your heart being transformed. Wouldn't it be great if you said... It's just, it just takes changing the environment. Just, change, just get out of your situation and you'll be good and you'll be good with God. And all that. No, it's your heart. He's transforming your heart or he should be transforming your heart 
right now. So I encourage you as a young person to know that to be transformed, these that's the evidence. What you're going to see is the fruit of the Spirit. If you're being transformed by God, there it is. There's the evidence right there. If you're seeing some of those other things in your life, like sexual immorality, idolatry, envy, some of those things, dissensions, divisions, envy, I mean, it's not quite a transformation going on inside of you. At least not the one that needs to be. So, decide for yourself tonight, understand for yourself tonight, whether you are that transformed person. Whether you are being transformed to where you're no longer sinning quite like you did before. Because we all need to, look, I talked about New Year's resolutions. Why? Because everybody makes these resolutions and they try and change, but ultimately, like, we can't change our own heart. We cannot change our own heart. We need God to do that in our life. We need some outside source to come in and change our heart. We can't just up and decide one day that, that I want to be a good person. That's not how it works. We need God to transform our hearts and transform our lives. So I encourage you to recognize, first of all, if you're transformed, if you're being transformed or if you're not being transformed by the power of God, and if you're not, begin to seek what must be done, what you must do. Really just seek God's face for that transformation in your life. Seek His face for hope and salvation and freedom. Right? And honestly, if you need to, you can talk to me. Let's see here. We got ten. Yes, sir. Ten people. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, if y'all would go ahead and bury your heads. We're just going to pray real quick. Uh, and then I'll let y'all go. Yeah, I just want to lift you uh, up and just lift these young people up. God, I just pray that we'd be a transforming people. I pray that we'd be uh, trusting in you each and every day, God, with uh, believing in the power of the Spirit in our lives to transform us, God, to make us more like the Spirit and less like the flesh, more like you and less like the world, God. May we have that. May we recognize, may each of us in here evaluate our own heart tonight and decide for ourselves, are we acting or being transformed, God? Are we being transformed very power? And if we're not, God, may we recognize that and seek you in such a way, God, that you begin to transform our hearts. Not necessarily our environment, not necessarily our surroundings, not necessarily our situation, God, but change who we are inside. Transform us. And I pray this in Jesus' name.